Please go ahead and turn to Matthew 5, one final time for this summer. Matthew chapter 5. I want you to follow along with me as I read as we begin here. Matthew 5. However, I will be reading a different <coughs> version of the Beatitudes than you're used to. From a different version that you are not familiar with, I guarantee it, because it's not even from the Bible. All right? Actually, you can call what I'm going to be reading. You're going to be reading the Bible, right? What I'm going to be reading, you could call the anti-beatitude. All right? A Christian blogger, Stephen Altrobi, deserves the credit for writing them. They make, they make some really powerful points. So, follow along from Matthew 5, 1. But listen to the message from a different perspective. All right? And Satan, seeing the horde before him, went down into the parched valley. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the kick-butt, independent, self-sufficient, I'm strong enough on my own people. For theirs is the kingdom of hell. Blessed are those who feel no sorrow over their sin, and who only express shallow, worldly repentance because of the consequences of their sin, because their hearts shall be hardened. Blessed are those who have swagger, who make others stagger, who have an entourage, who assert their own rights, who fight for their own agenda, for they shall inherit hell. Blessed are those who are indifferent to the ungodliness in their own lives and the ungodliness around them, because they will certainly have their fill of sin in this life. Blessed are those who show no mercy, who demand that every wrong be righted, who easily take offense, and who fight back against their opponents with slander, gossip, or outright brutality, for they shall receive the same in return. Blessed are those who allow many impurities infiltrate their heart, and who divide their heart's devotion between heaven and earth, for they shall not see the face of God. Blessed are those who cause strife, create division, relish controversy, and pit one man against another, for they shall be called sons of Satan. Blessed are those who manage to avoid persecution by quietly, harmlessly avoiding public godliness, for they will have large dwellings in hell. Blessed are you when others think you are fantastic, funny, Cruel, in, and the life of the party because of my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your pain in hell is great, for so they have treated the wicked throughout all of history. <laughs> As we've studied the true Beatitudes, which Jesus spoke, I hope that you've seen clearly that if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you are called to be distinctively different from the world around you. It's when we as God's people are different from the world that God immensely blesses us. It's a huge part of the point of the Beatitude. Today, We'll wrap up studying the God-blessed life and see where all of this blessing that we looked at should lead to. All right? So I invite you to pray with me as we approach God's Word once more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please open our eyes, open our hearts. May we be ready to receive from you this morning what you would have to say to us. If you want to change our lives, transform our perspectives, please do so through your word. May your spirit move among us, move in our hearts, keep shaping and forming us into your image. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So if you followed my instructions a moment ago, you've already read over Matthew 5, 1 to 12. So you saw how God blesses not all the people we talked about just then, but God blesses the poor in spirit and the mourning and the meek, the hungry and thirsty for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted, and how he, he blesses them with incredible blessings, each of them in its own right. Now technically at this point, the Beatitudes are finished. There are no more blessed R's here. But I want to take us one passage further into Matthew's five, Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Because I think that the next few verses describe the inevitable results of all that's gone before. The inevitable result of a God-blessed life. We haven't really explored much of what God's aim is in this. What His purpose in all these blessings is. Why does he bless the poor in spirit, or the meek, or the pure in heart, or the light? What is he wanting to accomplish? Why even bother to bless us? These verses, I believe, supply an answer to those questions. There's an interesting shift that happened in verse 13. Besides just not having any more blessed ours, there's been a big focus on heaven so far, right? A lot of the kingdom of heaven in, in this. Look at verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, sake for, the, sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 12, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And we are clearly to be heavenly minded and heavenly focused people. However, now Jesus says, but, you haven't left earth yet. You're still here. Look at verse 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And then in verse 14, you are the light of the world, of the earth, of the world. See, living with a focus on heaven doesn't mean we forget about earth. We don't ignore earth. We don't escape earth. We don't withdraw from earth. So how are we supposed to live in the meantime with this mindset of heaven, but living here on earth while we're still inhabitants of this world? The answer goes to the heart of why Jesus gave the Beatitudes in the first place. Here's why. God blesses his people. God blesses his people so that we distinctively stand out on earth. All right? God blesses his people so that we stand out as, as distinct people upon this earth. Okay, verse 12, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right after pointing us to both the, the future and the past, Jesus now points to the present. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the salt of the earth. This is an off-quoted verse, but it's not necessarily a very often understood metaphor. What does it mean that, that we, as Jesus' people, are the salt of the earth? Well, there are, are true two primary common uses for salt. Yeah, a seasoning and a preservative. Seasoning and a preservative. There's a, a third here in Canada as a de-icer. <laughs> but Jesus wasn't in an Arctic climate like we are, so I don't think that's what he was talking about. As a seasoning... You've all experienced the power of salt before, right? Even all the kids here, I know that you've all licked the salt shaker at some point. <laughs> but we've all sat down at a meal, tasted our food, and, and thought, it's missing something. That needs salt. Or maybe that needs more salt than it has. 
And so you, you get the salt shaker out and you, you add it to your food, and that tends to draw out the flavor of the food that you're eating. As a preservative, before the time of refrigerators and freezers, salt was used to preserve food. So say you had a, a hunk of meat that you wanted to, to save for a later date. In order to, to hold off decay or bacteria, you could coat it with salt, rub in the salt, and that would act as an antiseptic to keep the meat from rotting. So which picture is Jesus referring to here? We don't know for sure. Perhaps both. Maybe seasoning, it says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, right? However, taste there could also just refer to saltiness, period, which is essential for salt as a preservative as well. The fact of the matter is that both uses for salt would communicate the same main point that Jesus is trying to get across, that we are called to be distinct in the way that we relate to the world around us. Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, we are to be unlike the world. Salt is essentially different from the medium in which it is placed, and in a sense it exercises all its qualities by being different. So whether we're meant to add flavor to the world or preserve some goodness in the world, we would do either one or both by maintaining our distinctiveness from the world. But the same is going to go with the next picture in verse 14, which we'll get to, the light of the world. The, the common truth behind both of these metaphors is that the church and the world are distinct. And there is the earth and the world, and then there's the salt and the light. They're distinct. Verse 13 implies that the, the world that we're in is either rotting or tasteless or both. Right? That's what the picture would tell us. Of course, both are essentially true. History's proven time and time again mankind's tendency toward moral decay. Right? We, we start to think we're making progress and the mankind is seeing leaps and bounds and then something like a world war hits. Reminding us of our inherent rottenness. But God has placed us on this world like salt, in a sense, to prevent total decay. We are called to, to provide a restraining influence on the evil around us. Also, you don't have to look hard to see how tasteless or dull people find life on this earth. Feeling the need to chase every last thrill that pleasure and entertainment can afford. They're constantly trying to, to liven life up with food or drink or sex or technology or movies or music and so on. Trying to light it up. Or people try to inoculate themselves to this life with drugs and alcohol, medication, even self-harm. Especially as you approach a deathbed. Right? If you don't have Christ, life can be tasteless. But God has sprinkled us on this earth like salt to add the, the flavor of heaven to earth. To draw out the flavor of life on earth the way God intended it to taste. But verse 13 also contains a warning for us, the salt of the earth. Did you see it? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall, it be, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Chemistry tells us that sodium chloride, or salt as we know it, is a very stable element. And though it can be contaminated at times by other things on it, 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 and then if it does become contaminated, it becomes useless, even dangerous to use. 
The question Jesus asked, though, is rhetorical. If the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? The answer is it can't. It, if salt somehow loses its saltiness, it would be impossible to make it salty again. Can't do it. And what good is desalted salt? No good at all. Completely useless. I doubt it would even work well to be spread on icy streets. It basically becomes no better than road dust, is what Jesus said. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. The obvious implication for believers is this. Don't lose your saltiness. Keep your taste. Otherwise, it says we will be useless to stand out as God's people and to accomplish God's purposes on it. I like how John Stott puts this. He says, for effectiveness, the Christian must retain his Christ-likeness, as salt must retain its saltness. The influence of Christians in and on society depends on their being distinct, not identical. If Christians are indistinguishable from non-Christians, what's the point of us being here? Now, this verse doesn't actually imply that God will throw out his people. It just means that we are useless to him if we don't maintain our distinctiveness. Though I suspect that no true follower of Christ will ever get to a saltless point. Because all of Jesus' followers have his spirit inside of them. And they will begin to look more like him. As God transforms our hearts, we grow in Christ's likeness and in his qualities, like we just read in the Beatitudes, those types of things. And those types of things in the Beatitudes are the things that make us different from the people around us. So that we will stand out as poor in spirit and not private. We will stand out as repentant and not glim over sin. As meek and not independent or self-sufficient, merciful and not vengeful, and so on. If there was any doubt that this is what Jesus was saying, his second picture in verse 14 makes the same point. Look at that. Verse 14, he says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. So here we have two pictures, salt and light, both very distinct things which stand out in contrast to something else. Salt from, from whatever it is used on, and light from darkness. But let's look, dig a bit deeper here on, on the metaphor of light of the world. This would imply that the world is naturally a very dark place, which means light. And John Stott observes that the world is always talking about its enlightenment, but much of its boasted light is in reality darkness. And so Jesus sends his people out into the world as lights to illuminate the darkness. So what does it mean that we're being lights of the world? Well, it means here that, that we're not meant to be hidden. Right? Light isn't ever meant to be hidden. In other words, we're supposed to stand out. We're supposed to shine forth into darkness. That's why Jesus gives a comment about a city on a hill. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You're like, well, where did that come from? Right? What is a city have to do with anything. But it's all saying the same thing. We're meant to stand out and shine brightly. And three days from now, I'm getting on an airplane for a trip. And any of you who have flown at night before, can you can tell when you are over a city, right? If you're flying over the countryside and look out the window, it looks quite dark. Maybe just sprinkling of lights here and there. Very dark out there. But if you're flying over a city, all of a sudden, 
the ground is blanketed with light. Often, the big city, as far as you can see, is light. The city radiates light into the darkness, even in the middle of the night. In Jesus' day, of course, they didn't have electricity, so it would have looked a bit different. But they still had lights from oil lamps or torches or fires or the like. And when a number of people in one city all used their lights in the dark of the evening, that combined effect would be to still make the city seem to glow with light. So Jesus said, take a glowing city, put it on top of a hill or a mountain, not in a valley, put it on top of a hill, and then try to hide it. Good luck. You can't. Light will shine from the city. It will stand out from the surrounding darkness. And then Jesus says, if you try to hide the light, you completely defeat its purpose. Verse 15. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Now, I doubt many of you have much experience putting a light under a basket. Or a bushel, to use the older term. So it might sound like a, an ancient, outdated picture you can't relate to. But Jesus' point to the people of his day would have come across similarly. They wouldn't have done this either. They wouldn't have any experience doing this. In fact, it would have sounded ludicrous to do this. Who would ever like a lamp, likely an oil lamp, and then take a basket and cover it up, using up whatever valuable oil is in the lamp, and wasting the light that's produced by it. No one would ever do that. I mean, let alone the fire risk, right? But the whole point of lighting a lamp was to have light. Imagine how ridiculous it would be for me to, to flip on a light switch, to light up a room, and then to take some garbage bags, dark black garbage bags, go up and, and coat the entire light picture, just tape it up. Okay? If I wanted darkness, I wanted to turn the light on in the first place. You know, a lamp gets placed into a strategic location so that it can provide light. They put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. God has strategically left his people on this world for now, as he says, as the light of the world. His purpose for us is to shine. If we hide our light, it's defeating our entire purpose. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, Flight into the invisible is a denial of the call. A community of Jesus which seeks to hide itself has ceased to follow. It's a natural human tendency to try to hide our differences. We don't like to be different anymore. When Angela and I first dated, it was pointed out to me that I walk in a very distinct way. That, that the way I walked around my, my gait was very unique. It wasn't meant to cause offense, but when I learned that, I was appalled. I walk weird? <laughs> what? I don't want to walk weird. That's embarrassing. Over the next number of months, I was very conscientious about this, and I attempted to change the way I walked, to, to make it more normal. Don't know if I ever succeeded in it, at this point I don't care. <laughs> but my point is, when I discovered I was different, I attempted to hide that from other people. And we have this tendency in just about every area of life. In our diets, in our wardrobes, in our language that we use, in our entertainment choices. We want to fit in. We want to blend in. We want to at least be normal, if not cool. 
on a lot of things that doesn't really matter that much. But when it comes to your faith, Jesus says it's completely defeating the purpose of your faith if you blend in. Scott says the true Christian cannot be hidden. He cannot escape notice. He will be like salt. He will be like a city set upon a hill, a candle set upon a candlestick. And we can also add this further word. The, Christ, the true Christian does not even desire to hide his light. He sees how ridiculous it is to claim to be a Christian and yet deliberately to try to hide the fact. Let me ask you this. Are you hiding? Are you trying to conceal your light in any way? Do you at times try to, to, to pretend to have the same values or principles as unsafe people around you might have? Are you attempting to, to blend into the world around you by using the same words that they use? by wearing the same clothes, by watching the same movies, by reading the same books, even if those things might contradict or compromise your faith. Salt is worthless if its saltiness is lost. Light is useless if its light is concealed. We must not fail in our God-given functions. We must not fail the world that we're called to serve by our Heavenly Father. We must retain our saltiness. We must let our light shine. So let's get practical. How are ways we can do this? And what does it mean for you to be salt and light? In your home, in your workplace, in your study, or in your play. Here are a few ideas that I'll give you. First of all, instead of hiding, okay, openly live out your faith. Openly live out your faith. This is the main application point that Jesus gives in the very next verse. Look for me in verse 16. It says, in the same way, in the same way as these lights, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. John Stott says again, as the disciples of Jesus, we are not to conceal the truth we know or the truth of what we are. We are not to pretend to be other than we are, but be willing for our Christianity to be visible to all. We are to be ourselves, our true Christian selves, openly living the life described in the Beatitudes and not ashamed of Christ. There is a fundamental difference between Christians and non-Christians, between the church and the world. Jesus said they are as different as light from darkness. And we serve neither God, nor ourselves, nor the world by attempting to obliterate or even minimize this difference. We will often appear to be quite different, even odd in the world's eyes. And so be it. So be it. And after all, what fellowship has light with darkness? Christians are supposed to respond to hardship or even death in a different way than the world does. We are to react to injustice differently. We are to have a different disposition. We are to, to live our lives with a different rhythm of life and the world, with different boundaries. Ask yourself, is there anything that you do that your unsafe or anything that your unsafe friends do that you wouldn't do? Put it that way. Anything that your unsafe friends do that you wouldn't do? We need to 
develop the things we read about here in, the, in Scripture to our humility, our meekness, our mercifulness, our peacefulness. And then we can't be afraid to let those things run against the grain of those around us. Because they will. We should have integrity to, to openly be a Christian in every situation you find yourself. To be the same person at church than at home with your family and with your co-workers with everyone that you meet. Same person. As we do this, as we live out our faith, publicly loving God and loving others, growing in Christ like this, the world will notice the difference. They won't be able to blame it. They'll notice that we are different from them, and that's good. It's not bad. Lloyd Jones says, there can be no doubt that the first thing light does is to expose the darkness and the things that belong to darkness. The best way of revealing a thing is to provide a contrast. The gospel does that, and everyone who is a Christian does that. So, both we and the gospel that we preach provide needed contrast to the world's darkness. And this shows another way we should apply these verses. And that is to boldly speak the truth. Boldly speak the truth. You know the old saying, preach the gospel, use words if necessary? Pure baloney. Alright? Words are always necessary. We need the light of God's word. We need that. We are called to be the sugar of the earth. Right? We are called to be the sugar of the earth. And sometimes salt can sting a wound. We're called to be the salt and we're called to be the light. Boldly pulsating truth into our dark world. People need more than, than preservation from moral decay. People need regeneration through Christ. Lloyd Jones says, light not only exposes the darkness, it shows and provides the only way out of the darkness. And this is where every Christian should be jumping to the task. If we love the people around us, and maybe that's the question we need to ask, do we actually love the people around us? But if we love the people around us, we can't be afraid to share the message of Jesus with them. Because it is their only hope to be saved. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Speaking of the gospel, if we have any hope of applying this passage, we have to prayerfully rely on the true light of the world. And I'll explain what I mean by that. We have to prayerfully rely on the true light of the world. You see, being salt and light in this world may sound like an impossibly high, challenging calling for us. And if, and if we attempt to do this on our own power, it is actually impossible. We can't do this. We can't live it out. But if we have the Spirit of Almighty God living inside of us, we are not powerless. We have Jesus... And he is all the salt and light this world could ever be. In John 8, 12, Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Notice, if we follow Jesus, we have the light of life. We have it. Of course, he's the source. The source of our life. He's the oil in our oil lamps. He's the electricity in our wires. We are only the light of the world because of our relationship to the light of the world. So we must prayerfully and constantly, daily, hourly depend on him through prayer. Amen. And the more that we do this, the more we admit our need, for him, pray for his help, I believe the more that he'll actually shine through us. But today, you may be sitting here and, and you may 
have never received Christ's light before. So today you find yourself in darkness. Listen, the, the root cause of every trouble in your life can be traced to sin. Every, even every trouble in our world at large, from racism to cancer to genocide to war, is all rooted in our estrangement from God and our enmity towards God. That's where it comes from. We were created to live in God's light when we plunged ourselves into darkness. We were made by God to live according to God's ways for God's glory. And we cannot truly live like the way that He intended to apart from Him. And in our sinful state, the worst news, we're destined for even darker judgment one day. But in our groping around in the darkness, we cannot ever just stumble upon a solution. It's not going to happen. We need a light to shine into our hearts to expose sin and to illuminate the way out. Enter Jesus, the light of the world, who left heaven's glory and entered into our darkness. To show the way to live by living a perfect life himself, sinless life. And then, who let our darkness consume him. Kill him. Taking what we deserve. But in so doing, at the cross, Christ not only exposed the depths of our evil, how low we would stoop. He also illuminated a new and living way back to God to a restored relationship with God. Amen. It is through knowing Him and believing in Him, trusting in Him, that we are saved. Not only saved from sin and death, but also given new life and a new nature, even. A, a nature that, that Scripture says loves the light and hates the darkness instead of the opposite. If today you feel exposed by the light, you can leave your darkness behind you today. You can come into the light and receive Jesus' light of life. He has shown the way with, by being the light of the world. Through faith in Him, we can do it. The darkness that we're in is not worth it. Don't stay there. It will only ever lead to more darkness. Ephesians 5.14 promises, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ is shining. He is your only hope. Is all you need. So I hope if you have it, you can run in the name. Run into his light. For those of us who have done so, I encourage you to look at this passage. Look at our, our high calling as salt and light. To openly live out our faith, to boldly speak the truth, to, to prayerfully rely on Christ and recognize. That this is why God blesses us. Like he talks about in the Beatitudes. And he is working to create and mold the people that will stand out in these ways. We have to ask, have we received his blessings only to ignore our mission? Have we received his blessings? Only to ignore what he wants us to do. This is why we haven't just been lifted or raptured out of the earth. Right? It's why we're still here. 
And this gets at, at God's ultimate goal. And all we've looked at this summer from verse 1 all the way to verse 16. He wants us to stand out. But not because he wants to show us off. Right? He wants us to stand out in order to show off his glory. Here's our final main point. God blesses his people so that we distinctly show him off. Alright, God blesses his people. I hope that's you, I hope that's me. He blesses us, his people, so that we will distinctly show him off in this world. Read from verse 14. You, you, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. And why? So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This speaks to our motives, right? In our, in our spiritual growth, the religious activity that we would like. So often our motives is to, to shine before others so that we will grow. But we're supposed to shine in order to make God look good. And it's not just God's goal to exhibit His glory. He wants this to become our goal as well. And how do we shine? It says, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We shine by our God, by our good works. John Scott explains, it seems that good works is a general expression to cover everything a Christian says and does because he's a Christian. Every outward and visible manifestation of his Christian faith. Okay, that's what good works is talking about. And in context, I can't help but think this primarily refers to living out the Beatitudes. As you pursue righteousness with your whole heart, as you show others undeserved mercy, as you strive to make peace, as you rejoice in the face of reviling, persecution, and evil speech, these are good works that show yourself to be a child of God and a citizen of heaven. Things which, of course, you cannot do by yourself. These are our gracious blessings from God. Good works are the evidence of God's grace in your life, not the other way around. And so when people recognize that there is something about you, something otherworldly about you, that something supernatural has happened to you, to make you the person that you are, the only thing to praise is not you, but the one who made you that way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Any light that is in us is His light. Any good that is evident in us comes from Him. If people are not led to praise God because of our lives, we have to question it. Are we truly letting our light shine? Are we passionately seeking to grow more like Christ? Or are we maybe doing good works but soaking up all the attention and prestige ourselves? Instead of passing it on, passing on the glory to God. Pointing others to the one who saved them. Whenever someone notices us or praises something about us, it's really an excellent habit to develop, to find some way to deflect the praise back to God. To deflect the credit to Him. Whether it's just a simple praise the Lord. Or a, a recognition, you know, that was totally God. It wasn't me. I, I couldn't have done that without Him. Or with an expression of gratitude. You know, I thank God that He allowed me to play a part. 
It's like God has given us all big spotlights to shine on earth and put our hands on the handles. And you know those big spotlights at a sporting event or a concert, massive beams of light? Question is, where will we point our spotlights? At others? Back at ourselves? Or back to God? He deserves to have every spotlight fixed on him. No, he's the source of the light in the first place. First Peter 3 12 says to all believers that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. In other words, a very distinct people. And for what purpose? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. The question is, where are we pointing the light that we've been given? So the God blessed light. What does it look like? At the end of the day, you can say it looks like Christ. And he's exemplified it. And how do we attain to the God-blessed life? And we, can, we can make efforts to grow to be like Christ. But ultimately, it is all of grace. It's all of grace. Every blessing is because God chose to love us and bless us. I don't know if you noticed this, but as we went through this series, the, the Beatitudes, all the blessed are, they are all about God blessing people, not people blessing themselves. Right? They're all about God blessing people, not people blessing themselves. These are not secret formulas for us to earn or, or conjure up an amazing life. I actually tried to, to phrase the major point of each message in the same way to make this point. I don't know if you noticed that if God blesses a certain kind of people, God blesses them, God blesses a certain kind of people by giving them himself or something of his. Okay, listen. Number one. God blesses people who realize their inner poverty by enriching them with his kingdom. God blesses people who mourn their sin by comforting them with his compassion. God blesses people who humbly submit to his control by giving them his world. God blesses people who crave for righteousness by satisfying them with his fullness. God blesses people who show mercy to others by showing them his own mercy. God blesses people who have pure hearts by opening their eyes to his person and presence. God blesses people who strive to make peace by making them part of his family. And God blesses people who are hurt for his sake by rewarding them with his heaven. In every case, the source of blessing was God. And the blessing itself was of God. And they're all about him. In his love, he says they are meant for his people. They're meant for us. But much more importantly, they are meant to showcase his glory.
would you change our hearts? Make us like you, not for our sake, but for yours. Not to us, but to your name, Lord. Now we are unworthy recipients, and so we sit here and we revel in your grace. Open our eyes to it's incredible, this is amazing, this God. Of every day be shaped by this reality and awaken our hearts to Christ, to glorify you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.